January 1926, almost 100 years back, Erwin Schrodinger published a series of papers that went on to change physics. He postulated the Schrodinger equation, which became the foundational pillar of quantum mechanics and as a result modern physics. But just 10 years later, in 1935, he wrote a few more papers critiquing the interpretations of his own theory. He gave the very famous cat in a box thought experiment. This is not a real experiment. There are no real cats involved, but it was given as a reductio ad absurdum to highlight the absurdities or limitations of quantum mechanics, especially when applied to the classical world. But history is full of twists. Although originally this was given as a critique of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, today however, The same thought experiment is part of the foundations of the quantum mechanical theory. Any student who goes to college to study quantum mechanics will be introduced to this thought experiment at the very beginning. Why? Because this experiment encapsulates so much that is peculiar about quantum mechanics, whether it is quantum superposition, collapse of the wave function, quantum entanglement, etc., etc. So why was Schrodinger upset with the interpretation of quantum mechanics? What were his criticisms and were those criticisms resolved in the last 100 years? Let's see. The thought experiment goes something like this. A cat is placed in a closed chamber with a radioactive atom that has a 50% probability of decaying in the next 1 hour. This radioactive material is connected to a GM counter which when activated through the process of a hammer breaks a vial of cyanide which releases poison inside the chamber thus killing the cat. So if the radioactive atom decays the cat dies and if the radioactive atom does not decay the cat remains alive. This intrinsically links the life and death of a cat with the decay or non-decay of a radioactive atom. And since atoms are described by the quantum theory, the same physics that applies to an atom now must also be applicable to that of a cat. Which means if an atom exists in a quantum superposition of decayed and not decayed, that would mean the cat should also exist in a quantum superposition of dead or alive until an observation is made. So what is the issue that was raised by Schrodinger in this particular experiment? You see in quantum mechanics we have something called the measurement problem or the wave function collapse in the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics which means that quantum particles can exist in a superposition of different states for example a particle can exist at multiple locations at the same time until an observation is made and when the observation is made the particle chooses a definite position same goes for momentum same goes for energy a particle exists in multiple energy levels of an atom before an observation is made but the moment a measurement is actually made by an external observer or a measuring device the particle's wave function collapses into something definite this is known as the wave function collapse and according to this before anyone opens the chamber the cat is in a state of being both alive and dead at the same time and it is only when an observation is made by opening the chamber the state of the cat is revealed to us and schrodinger was simply highlighting this problematic part of quantum mechanics by using the analogy of a cat he was questioning that how is this actually possible does it even make any sense and second of all is the cat really alive or dead now i want to answer these two questions today so let's look at it in a little bit more detail so let's look at it like this if the atom decays then it decays to a ground state where the electron is in a lower energy level and if it doesn't decay then the electron is in a higher energy level it is in a excited state but the quantum description of this atom before we actually make a measurement is a quantum superposition of both these two states the ground state as well as the excited state unless an observation is made only when a measurement or an observation is performed the atom is revealed to us whether it is in the ground state 
or in the excited state. But before an observation, the only way quantum mechanics can describe this atom is a quantum superposition of both the ground and the excited states. Now, since I already told you that the life of the cat and the life of the atom is now entangled together, so a description of the atom directly influences the description of the cat. So if we have this kind of a quantum mechanical description of the atom, we must also have a same kind of a quantum mechanical description of the cat, that the cat must be alive and dead at the same time. And if that is not possible, if we cannot have a quantum description of the cat, then we should not be able to have a quantum description of the atom either. Either both descriptions are correct or both descriptions are incorrect. This is the fundamental paradox that was raised by Schrodinger. He said that this is the nature of the quantum mechanical theory that the moment I connect this with a classical system, the absurdity reveals itself. Can you even imagine this kind of a scenario where a cat is alive and dead at the same time and it is only opening the box that reveals to us whether the cat is actually dead or alive. So in a way, it is a person who opened that box or made the first measurement who kind of killed the cat in the first place. But do you see where I'm going with this? The whole idea is ridiculous. It is absurd. It is non-commonsensical. It just doesn't fit with the way we will live in this classical world. And yet that is the description which we are forcing on to the quantum world. For over 100 years now, the quantum mechanical theory has proved itself to be a very successful description of the subatomic world. So what's happening? Why this absurdity when we implement the very same quantum rules into the classical world. So the question is, what role does this measurement process or this observation play in the reality of that particular system? Does an external observer play a role in the system choosing a particular state? You see, when I was much younger, many, many years back, I was uh, in the Himalayas. I lived in a monastery for a couple of months. I went there to study Buddhism, the philosophy of Buddhism. And I was introduced to certain very peculiar metaphysical questions. Does the moon really exist if one doesn't look at it? If a tree falls in a forest and no one saw it, did it really fall? These are questions with deep philosophical and metaphysical implications as to how we view reality. Now, on the surface of it, if somebody hears these questions for the very first time, you would probably think that these are absurd questions. And maybe you are right. But if you take a few steps back, if you peel off the layers of our assumptions, then these questions do suggest or at least question the role of an observer in the physical reality that they sees or measures, which is what is revealed to us by quantum mechanics. In fact, this idea of a conscious observer having a active role in the collapse of the wave function was a very popular idea for a very long time. Scientists like John von Neumann and Eugene Wigner showed that you can extend the quantum description of a measured system all the way up the chain from the particle to the detector to the neuron to the brain to the consciousness. To obtain something definite, something outside the quantum system must intervene. And many scientists propose that it is the conscious mind of the observer that may play a role in the final step. Now, I know that this kind of a school of thought is very appealing in certain contexts, but I have to just give it to you as it is. Modern physicists have decided to reject this notion for various reasons, of course. First of all, we don't really know what consciousness is, even though we have advanced so much in our knowledge of the universe from big bangs to black holes, we are yet to have a good mathematical or physical description of what consciousness is, let alone its role in the measurement process. It is untestable as of now. 
And there is no mathematical description of this kind of a measurement collapse by an external consciousness. For now, there are scientifically much more popular explanations of what's happening here. One early explanation was that of the many worlds explanation. So in this interpretation, once you make a measurement, the wave function never really collapses. In fact, all possibilities of that particular wave function collapse is realized, but in alternate universes, in alternate non-communicable realities or worlds. Reality splits into all kinds of possibilities. So the moment an observer opens this box, one reality is when the cat is alive and the other reality is when the cat is dead. Both these two realities are realized but in separate non-communicable existences or worlds. Now this is a very popular idea especially in science fiction. These days many of you will be aware of this. Many of you may have heard of parallel worlds or the concept of multiverses. And theoretically, it is an appealing idea because it removes the complexities of the measurement problem because a system evolves in a very deterministic manner, although in separate realities. But the problem, again, is that this is an untestable theory. And of course, there are issues related to splitting of the worlds into infinite possibilities at all times simultaneously throughout time. Now that is something that although removes the collapse of the wave function absurdity but creates new ones. So let's move on to another interpretation. One of them is provided by the very famous Roger Penrose in his Penrose's Gravitational Collapse Theory, where Roger Penrose suggests that the wave function collapse is not random and it also does not require a conscious observer. In fact, it has something to do with gravity. You know, all systems have a certain imprint in the space-time fabric due to them having mass. And it is the curvature in the space-time fabric that has a role to play in the wave function collapse of a given system. Whenever we are dealing with some kind of a heavy object, classical macroscopic systems, the time period required for the wave function collapse is very, very small, as you can see from this expression. There isn't experimental verification to this idea as of yet, but Roger Penrose is one of my favorite human beings out there. So I wanted to include his observation as well. But what is the most accepted explanation for this Schrodinger cat paradox, for the Copenhagen interpretation or the measurement problem? It is what is today known as decoherence. Decoherence is in today's consensus of modern physics, the most accepted version of this problem that we are talking about. As in, what happens to the cat? Is the cat really dead or alive? So let's first understand what decoherence is. You see, decoherence is the process through which a quantum system loses its quantumness. Essentially, the idea that a quantum system can exist in a superposition of mutually exclusive states. This Quantumness is a property that is inherent to atomic particles, electrons, protons, atoms. But it is not obvious when it comes to classical systems. So somewhere along the line, there is a loss of this particular property. And that happens due to interaction with the environment. You see, particles do not exist in isolation. Particles are always existing as part of an environment in which they are interacting. So for example, even if you have a cat in a box, the cat has a large number of molecules in his or her body. It releases thermal radiation. There is gas in the chamber. The molecules of the uh, chamber gases are interacting with the body of the cat. There is temperature fluctuation. There is exchange of thermal energy. The body of the cat is constantly interacting with its environment and it is in fact not an isolated system. System. So what happens is that whenever a quantum mechanical system is studied in an isolated manner, we have this kind of a quantum superposition. But the moment it starts interacting with environment, 
it loses this quantum superposition. Let's understand it using this example. So if you have a single electron, we know that a single electron ha can have two different kinds of spin. The electron can be described as a superposition of both the spin up and the spin down states. But this is true only for a singular electron, an isolated electron. What happens if the electron this electron interacts with another electron. We can always create a scenario in which the interaction of the electrons happens in such a manner that their states become mutually exclusive. They essentially become quantum entangled. Then if I measure the spin of the first electron and it comes out to be spin up, it automatically means that the spin of the second electron will be spin down. And if the spin of the first electron is spin down, it automatically means that the spin of the second electron will be spin up. You see what's happening? Both the electrons are now entangled in terms of their states. What is happening here? If you notice, before an electron interacts with another electron, so when we talk about a singular electron, it exists in a superposition of spin up and spin down. But the moment it interacts with a separate electron, now it exists in a superposition with another electron. That means one electron's spin cannot be explained without referring to the other electron's spin. So now the electron is no more in a local mixed state. Instead, it is in a mixed state which is a little bit more global, which involves two particles. And to explain the spin of one electron, you must also explain the spin of the other electron. Now imagine if there is another electron which comes into the picture and this system will get quantum entangled with that electron. What if I add one more electron? What if I add one more atom and one more atom? I will end up creating a very complicated array of particles where each of the particle state is connected to every other particle in that given system. This is what happens when a particle interacts with the system. The quantum coherence or the quantum superposition of a singular electron is now transferred to a global superposition of a large number of electrons constituting the environment. And without knowing the uh, state of every other particle in the environment, it is not possible to define the state of that singular electron. This loss of quantum superposition when a particle interacts with other particles, thereby creating layers of entanglement in the process, which cannot be calculated or measured, is known as decoherence. You see different kinds of particles experience this kind of a decoherence in different time scales. If it is a small particle like an electron which is interacting with a nearby nucleus, the time scale may be measurable. But if it is a macroscopic particle like a cat in a box, the time scale is very, very, very small, almost zero for our considerations. So this is how decoherence gives us a practical explanation as to the loss of the quantumness or the quantum superposition property that is clearly present in the atomic world when we come to the classical world. So in the atomic world, quantum superposition exists, theoretically speaking, and in isolated systems. But the moment we come to a classical world where large number of particles are there, where there is a huge number of interactions between those particles, there is a loss of that quantum property that takes place. There is a loss of the quantum superposition that is so inherent in the Copenhagen interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics. So therefore, coming back to our original Schrodinger cat thought experiment, the most accepted version of what's happening to the cat is given by decoherence. The cat is a macroscopic object that is interacting with its environment. Practically speaking, the cat cannot be in a quantum superposition. As far as classical world is concerned, we have to take a sigh of relief. The cat is not both dead and alive at the same time. In fact, the cat is either dead or it is alive. We may not know it until we open the box, but that doesn't mean that the cat is in a superposition. The cat is still dead or alive. This is how decoherence explains how quantum properties uh, transform into classical systems. However, one of the original critique, which is the wave function collapse and what it is and what does it mean, that still remains. That is still unresolved. 
So I hope that in this video you have understood what the Schrodinger cat's experiment was all about. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want me to make similar videos in the future, do tell. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. I'm Divya Jyoti Das. This is for the love of physics.